If you wanna grow more food, but you don't have a ton of space, or if you've been battling with fungal and different types of diseases, then vertical gardening is something you definitely wanna check out. We have a lot of space, actually. We have a lot of acreage and a really large garden spot, but I like to put as much in a small amount of space as possible because it's less work on my part and less maintenance. And living in the Pacific Northwest, where we actually do get quite a bit of rain normally and battle with a lot of fungal diseases and some bacteria, I found that vertical gardening has really helped to solve a lot of those issues and allowed me to grow more from the same amount of space and the same amount of plants than when I wasn't using vertical gardening. So this trellis system we put in this year and these are 16 foot hog panels. So we just have them on four foot metal T posts that we've obviously pounded into the ground. And I would guesstimate this is probably about four feet. I haven't actually taken a tape measure, um, but it's about a four foot distance or my arm span width here. And so we just adhered them with just a simple metal clip. These hog panels are pretty heavy. They're really sturdy. Um, and so with just one metal clip where we've secured it here to the post, we've had some pretty good winds and lots of rain and they're pretty heavy. They're not going anywhere. But here I've got my pickling cucumbers. So I planted them on the outside of this because I'll be putting some fall crops in here in just another week or two. And you can see most of them have started to trellis. I just kind of have to lift them up. Um, this one, you can see, I have not trained to go up there yet. And so I just need to put that up there. And I might have to tie this one. But you can see a lot of these, I've just kind of woven through each of the hog panels. So I brought it on the inside here, and then I'm now having it go back on the outside. And they've got their little trendles here. So they will start to reach out and to hold and pull themselves up and attach themselves. But then sometimes with the bigger ones here, I just use baling twine. Baling twine is like my solution for everything, but jute twine works well, any type of string. So I've got that tied here. You just wanna make sure that you have it tied loosely enough that you're not actually cutting into the vine and the stem. So I've actually got my little pickling cucumbers here. This is gonna be the first harvest. It's mid-August, but we had a really cool, really cool and wet, unfortunately, beginning of summer. So a lot of the stuff is just now coming on. It's super late, but I am still going to get a harvest. But the great news is, even though we had a ton of rain, especially in June, I think we may have broke some records actually in the Pacific Northwest of Western Washington State for rain. I don't have any disease on these cucumber plants because they're up in this trellis system. They get a lot more airflow and they're not down on the ground. And so I don't have any downy or powdery mildew, which is something in past years that I've really had to battle with. And this is not just for cucumbers, so it works great for cucumbers as well. You can do any squash on here. You can do winter squash, you can do your summer squash, but I'm also using it for my tomatoes. So with the tomatoes, blight is something a lot of people deal with, and that is from any type of overhead watering. So overhead sprinkler, and of course rainfall. So we just use plastic on top of these hog panels and my friend, clothespins. Clothespins are not just for clothes. They hold very, very well. So that's how we attach these here. And then we did put some pool noodles on the very top of these metal T-posts. So obviously that it wouldn't puncture through this plastic. But the tomatoes are doing great. And of course my handy dandy baling twine again. Um, I've got these tied up to the hog panels to keep them upright and so that we have good airflow. But I'm also keeping both the overhead sprinkler and the rain off of these guys. So again, I don't have any signs of blight or any type of fungal disease on these. And these ones over here are my San Marzano Lungos. And then this one, um, this one is I think a black, crim or a Cherokee. I didn't actually stake and label these once I got them planted. So as soon as it gets a little bit bigger and ripening, I'll know for sure. But I know I only did one paste tomato and that's my San Marzano Lungos. Now up next, and you can also see I've got some lettuce in here and some dill. I did have more lettuce that has you can see it's going to seed um, that I've already pulled out, but you can grow multiple crops on the inside. 
So we just continued this trellis system all the way down the length of this row. And now I'm in here with my pole beans, which I have to tell you, I've tried a ton of different trellising systems in the past for pole beans. This is my absolute favorite because harvesting is so easy. As you can see, I've got, we've already done one picking. I've already canned 10 pints. We'll be picking and canning again these tonight, but you can see it's so easy. You can see all of the beans and you can just even pick from overhead, which I'm not quite ready to harvest these yet. We're gonna to wait to tonight because the kids are gonna be helping on this harvest. Um, but I really love this system and the beans are able to grow all the way up and then they can continue down the other side. The interesting thing about pole beans is if they do not have enough of a climbing um, structure, they will stop growing. They know those tendrils and the vines that they send out, if they don't have anything that will support them, they won't grow, they'll stay very stunted. And so the more structure that you can give them, then the larger and taller the plant's gonna be. And that means the more blossoms you get that turn into beans and therefore you get more of a harvest. The other great thing is they don't slide down. So if you've ever tried just straight up and down poles for your pole beans, once the weight of the plant and the beans get on there and then you tugging from picking them, oftentimes they'll start to slide down, which we don't want. We want them to stay all the way up um, so that they can grow and that they also have that airflow between them so they don't get any type of fungal disease in there, which you can see is very well sufficiently supported this way. So I really like this system for pole beans and I don't know that I will ever go back to my TP trellis system again, I think we're gonna stay with this. If you wanna check out the trellis system that I used in the past, which was doing the bean teepees, um, I'll show a link to that where we did those, but I really do feel like this is a better system and we're really happy with it. Plus, I've got all my Brussels sprouts growing down here, so they're shaded. These are a cool weather plant. They don't like a ton of heat during the summertime, so this is gonna help them to continue to grow and produce. And then I've also got a second fall crop, even though it's the middle of August right now, of carrots sown that need to be thinned. <laughs> I haven't thinned them yet, but they're growing right through here. So again, right now it's, it's fairly early morning, um, but once the sun is up a little bit further in the sky, the beans will shade it and the carrots will stay out of the hottest part of the sun of the day, which is ideal because carrots like a little bit cooler weather. Um, so I'm really happy with this system, with this trellis system, but there's other ways that you can use and do some vertical things if you don't have um, the hog panels. I'm trying to remember how much they were. They're not super expensive, but they're not really cheap either. So it's a little bit of an investment, but we'll use these same fence posts and hog panels for years to come. Some of the other options that we've got here in the garden for vertical is, again, it's using those metal T-posts. I love the metal T-posts because they don't ever rot. They're super sturdy and they're pretty easy to pound in and then also to pull out. So we just transfer them all over the place. So this is the very last of my sugar and snow peas. And you can see it's very much at the end of the season. We're mid-August. I'm actually surprised that I even have some that are still alive. Um, usually this late in the year, they're not. As I said, we've been a little bit cool. Um, so this is not hog panels. This is just kind of like that welded um, rectangular fencing. But this does work well for your snow peas. Now it's not as high, so you can see that I don't have the height. Um, so some of the snow peas got really tall and then they just kind of bent over and started going down the other side, which is fine. Um, but really with these vining plants, the taller you can go, the better. But if you don't have any way to put up something that's super high, you can still use these smaller structures like this and even this cheaper, smaller wire, and it will still work. So these are my family's heirloom Tar Heel Green pole beans. My family's been seed saving them since the 1800s, probably further back, at least five generations. And my grandparents, grandparents brought them out here with them from Appalachia, North Carolina in the early 1940s when my family migrated to Western Washington. And so those are our green beans, but then we've got other pole beans over here that are not in the tunnel trellis, but we've got them up on hog panels that we just have done. These are the smaller ones. Um, they're the eight foot, so we have them going eight foot in length. So they are up taller. Again, they're to those T posts. I actually got them zip tied there so that they stay on there. But these are a shelled pole bean. So 
they grow obviously on a pole. They're not a bush bean, so they need this trellis structure. Um, but you don't eat them as you do a green bean. We're going to let these fully develop, and the bean inside the pod here will actually shell out. And we call them an October bean. Um, I think they are probably related to a cranberry bean. Um, but they're a pretty large bean, probably about twice the size of a pinto bean, um, but you use them like you would a pinto or a kidney bean. So they're great in soups and chilies and stews, or we just like to have them with just a little bit of bacon or fat back in cornbread. Oh, they're just amazing that way. So I've got these here, and these ones are heavier, and you can see where they have started to, um, they're vining up here and then they're realizing that there's nothing else structure wise for them to go. So ideally, we may do another large bean tunnel for these guys like we did for the um, Tar Heel Green pole beans um, because they'll just start to then vine onto each other. So you've got these ones that saw, oh, this is a structure that's up higher, but it's actually just another bean plant. So they'll kind of vine together and then the weight of that, you can see where it's done that here. We'll kind of bring them back down so they still will flower and they still will produce a bean um, but i would get even more if they had more of that structure so you can see i mean you probably could go seven eight feet with these it's really amazing how tall they will get and how prolific they will become so i've got um, these ones as i said here are the shelled bean and then behind them i've got more brussels sprouts so again one of the beautiful things about using this vertical system is it allows me to grow a lot in one space, but I also can grow other crops behind it and take advantage of the shade that it provides. So I've got lots of Brussels sprouts here. And then this one is the, the same thing. It's just another one of those hog panels just turned on its side um, to the T post. But these are a black Cherokee bean and so it's the first year that i've grown these i'm super excited to get them and to try them i am part cherokee so it feels kind of exciting to be able to grow these um but it's been really interesting because the other ones we've seed saved for in my family and in this area since the 40s anyways they've been in in the western washington climate and these ones i had to replant twice and you can see they're not nearly as tall. They got a much later start. Um, so it'll be, I'm very excited to see what the harvest is like, but I know that I'm probably not going to get as much of a harvest as I am from the other ones because they're not acclimated yet really to our growing conditions. But you can see here it is, it's in August. Um, hopefully I don't have any little beans yet. I've got lots of blossoms. Um, thankfully our last frost usually doesn't come our killing frost until the very end of September or even sometimes beginning mid-October, just depending on, on the type of summer that we're having. So hopefully there'll be enough time that I'll actually get to be able to harvest some of these. Um, but the other thing that we use when we're doing vertical, and you can see there's obviously here that we don't have any disease going on, which is great with this vertical option. Um, but with our tomatoes, I did show you, you can do them with the little trellis system that we have, like with the beans and the tunnel system, but really a high tunnel is ideal if you live in an area that gets a lot of moisture, really humid, or you're battling with fungal disease or things like blight. So this is just an old, it's like a metal carport. You buy it like, I think we got it at Costco like over 16 years ago and we converted it to our high tunnel. So we put this greenhouse plastic on there. And this year we're doing a slightly different trellising system. So we put in extra support because this had gotten caught in a windstorm and we had uh, some bent poles. So we put extra beams to support here. And then you can also see we did some of those beams there to give this some support. And we drilled holes through the center of these posts and then we used wire all the way down the line. I've got three rows of tomatoes in here. And then, not a big surprise, baling twine and I did have some jute twine here I ran out of baling twine actually believe it or not we use the big round bales and my brother uses square bales so I had to go to my brother's barn and raid his baling twine with permission of course um, so these I have just found um, I've tried like the tomato cages in the past they never work for me my tomatoes these are just cherry tomatoes and you can see how tall and, and how much they have on them here I've got um, back here I've got the um, Cherokee tomatoes, and then I've got a lot more of the San Marzano lungos, but they're all indeterminate, meaning they're going to keep growing until we get a frost. So they can get upwards of like by the end of August, beginning of September, sometimes they can be up towards six feet if I, especially if I haven't pruned them back at all. So it's kind of jungle-esque, but there's so much fruit on them 
that they just collapse those tomato cages. So I found that being able to tie them up as well as keeping them pruned. So if you wanna learn how to prune your tomatoes, you can watch that tomato pruning video as well. But I found that tying them up like this has really worked um, the best for us over any other system that I've tried when it comes to trellising the tomato plants. So last but not least with our trellising or going vertical system, we have our grape barber. So the grape barber is actually only holds four grape plants. We have two on each side. This side is a Niagara, which is a wine grape. And then on the other side, I have Interlochen, which is a white seedless table grape. But believe it or not, everything that you see here is from just two grape plants. But the great thing about this is, as you can see, I'm standing in the shade, it's in August. So this is one of our favorite spots to actually come and congregate when it's hot outside. It provides a lot of shade. And if you happen to be having an outdoor event and it starts to drizzle, which we're a little bit known for here in Washington state, um, you actually have such a thick mat of the grape leaves now, in a downpour, it's not going to really keep you dry. But if it's just like a little bit of a light drizzle, um, it actually stays pretty dry in here. But the beautiful thing is, as far as actual ground space, it doesn't take up very much space at all. But we've got all of these grapes that are growing in here. And these will be ready to harvest um, usually about mid-September. If they can go through a frost, they're a lot sweeter. Um, it's just keeping them, the birds out of them <laughs> long enough that we can get them to go through the frost and then we still have some to harvest. But the grapes go all the way up. Um, I may even need a ladder to get some of them up on the top levels there. Uh, but this is another great way that you can use. This would just be a patio area otherwise um, that you can turn into food production for you and your family. And again, with this vertical structure like this, it does definitely help um, with any type of fungal disease. So we've not really battled any type of disease with the grapes. We've had them in here for I think 13 plus years, and we've never had any type of disease issues with them. So they've grown really well for us here in Western Washington. So as I have said many times, we live in Western Washington and I'm in gardening zone 7A. I often get asked what gardening zone we're in. And so right now it's at mid August, I've gotten one harvest from our green beans and I'll get a harvest off of the cucumbers tomorrow. And we've been harvesting from the zucchini for about a week and a half. Um, I've gotten some cherry tomatoes, but none of my large tomatoes are ripe yet. And none of the shell beans or of course the winter squash, none of those are close to being ready yet. Uh, the onions will still probably be a couple more weeks. And so this is part of the Homesteaders of America's growing your own food for 2020. So you guys can get ideas from other people's gardens and see in different parts of the country and climates kind of what production looks like and the timing. Now I will say that your gardening zone, people always want to know what your gardening zone is, but when you're doing an annual vegetable garden, your gardening zone doesn't have anything to do with it. It is your first and last frost dates that are most important. So my last frost date in the spring is usually the end of April, first part of May, which means I can plant these warm weather plants about mid-May, sometimes as late as Memorial Day, just depending upon the temperatures that we're having for that year. And then in the fall, sometimes if we get a really early killing frost, because I'm up in the foothills of the Cascade Mountains on the west side of the Cascade Mountains in Northern Washington State, sometimes we'll get a killing frost up here in the foothills mid-September. Usually it's more towards the end of September or the first part of October. And if we're really lucky, it'll be like around October 10th, which is what I'm really hoping for this year that we have a super late frost. But just to give you a little bit of reference point, um, you can have all types of different gardening zones, but it's those first and last frost dates. It's really going to depict uh, when you're gonna be planting, which then also means when you're going to be harvesting.